Welcome everyone to another Voices with Raveki. I'm very excited about uh, today's episode. Uh, so when I was in Cambridge, and this is a great story. When I was in Cambridge, I was giving a talk and the gentleman who you're seeing here uh, walked up and he said, uh, I'm Sebastian Morello, and I, I knew I knew the name, but I couldn't place it, and I was thinking, and then he said, you're always talking about my book, and this is the book I, I've often talked about, uh, The World is God's Icon, um, which makes a very clear and I find convincing argument for a Neoplatonic reading of uh, Thomas Aquinas, and it aligns with, you know, um, readings by Clark um, and uh, DC Schindler and other. It's a beautiful book. And and I said, wow, Sebastian. And I was so excited. Um, so I, I said, you know, when I get back, you know, we got to set up uh, a conversation. We've already talked privately. And uh, I foresee this is going to be the beginning of, 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 of a long and fruitful philosophical fellowship. So welcome, Sebastian. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very grateful. And, uh, and I'm glad you've taken such an interest in my in my work, so it's it's great. Thank you. So, Sebastian, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself, where you are, what your background is, and then we can get into some of the topics you'd like to discuss. Sure. Um, so, uh, I live here out in in Bedfordshire, in in England, uh, with my wife and three children. Uh, I spend most of my time uh wandering about in the fields and the woods in the surrounding areas with uh with my with my whippet and um uh and and thinking about um uh well i try i i generally fluctuate between thinking about uh the rather abysmal uh state of affairs in the political world right. and um uh a, 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 and the god whom uh who, who makes it all okay again um, right. and um, uh, and I um, I write a lot for uh, particularly a, a publication called the European Conservative, right? Um, yeah. Which which uh, is a publication that really uh, just writes pieces about European civilization and history, yes. and uh, and I do a bit of editing for them. Uh, and other than that, uh, I've I've got a book coming out later this year. Um, uh, with Routledge um, on political theory, particularly focusing on uh, second person perspective and the right. kind of interpersonal presuppositions and commitments that I think are necessary for a stable political life. So I know that's an area that you're really interested in and, I, and, I, yeah. and, and hopefully we can explore a bit. Um, and I'm just writing another book at the moment, I've just started it, uh, which is less a work of academic philosophy, but uh, but really just about, um, well, it's just it's just about how I came to fall in love with with God, really, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and 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 my travels around Asia and things like that, uh, and and just just writing that down. So that might be uh, a bit of fun, and um, and I'm supposed to be taking up a job in September in Princeton University uh, right. at their Department of Politics. Right. So uh probably by the end of the year we'll be on the same side of the atlantic and we can uh, we can meet up again which would be nice that'd be wonderful so that's me that's yeah. me that's um wonderful. and the the thing i mean i what i'm I, obviously i've been i have been uh watching some of your material from which i've benefited enormously and um i i loved meeting you in cambridge and having that chance to chat and we've chatted since and there are three areas which 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 are reoccurring themes in your own thought, mm -hmm. which um, you know each time you 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 move into these areas, my ears prick up uh, particularly. And 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 the reason why I think is because they're areas not only where we share a mutual interest, but they they don't converge in an obvious way. I'm not saying they don't, but they don't right. in yeah. an obvious way. Right, right. And that's one your your particular pr preference for a neoplatonic framework to understand yes, yes. wider reality and also to recapture uh a an aspect of the world that entails meaning right yes, yes um yes. which you've talked about very eloquently um the 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 other is 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 the notion of the person not so much as an object in the world and not simply as a synonym of human being as just our species kind but but really 
at this condition of relatedness and interpersonal yes. relatedness, which um, uh, which is much more what we mean, I think, by person, which gives yes. rise to the kind of unique, non-transferable uh, mm. uh, entity that we that we're really talking about. Which which is the more I've thought about that, and the more I've listened to you speak about that, the more I've realised that notion of person is very very deep within our, our language even yes. you know when we talk about look i want to see you in person yes, we're yes. saying i need to to you in order for right right uh, uh, and then and then just just finally um something that you talked about a bit in in cambridge this notion that knowledge is not primarily but or or not solely, I'll say yes. knowledge is not solely propositional knowledge. Yes, yes. But we have to start thinking about knowledge as the embodied experience of the world. Yes. This doesn't only chime with this existentialist notion of person as a condition of relatedness, but yes. also I think it it brings in this incarnational aspect to a Neoplatonic ontology. Yes, yes. And 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 you know, we've talked a little bit about the fact that the academy used to have this. The, the academy itself used to it was it, it used to form the whole person as if the yes. seminar and and the lecture hall was not the only part of of what the academy was trying to do in the in the bringing to the fore of human flourishing. So the the dialogue that you're that you're bringing out of this tripartite framework is one that that I find incredibly compelling. And so I just I just love the opportunity to chat more about it with you. Really. Well, 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 thank you for that, Sebastian. Um, um, yeah, yeah I, I, I really enjoyed our, our brief talk at Cambridge and the more extensive one we had a few days ago. Um, I'll start with some of the comments I, I already mentioned to you around those three poles and how I um, start to see them possibly weaving together so we get an integrated intelligibility for them. Um, and, I, and, I, and I like to start with the notion of person. Oh, by it, before I forget, I ordered that book you recommended on the second person perspective within Aquinas's work. Yeah, um, Andrew Pinsent. Yeah, Pinson, exactly. It's so thank you for that recommendation. Yeah, yeah it, I should get it in a couple of days. So, Brilliant. well, the thing I, I very much um, see personhood the way you say as an inherently relational thing, um, uh, and um, I want to talk about its ex existential aspect and how it's, uh, I think, properly iconic for an important feature of our ontology, which I call transjectivity, and try and put those uh, together in some important way. I tend to think of personhood um, a a as the fact that there is something about you, just for example, that I can, in that I can internalize that becomes a proper part of me, which is, sounds really odd. Um, in, 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 in a particular way. But here I'm thinking specifically of the Vygotskyan notion. Um, I, uh, when I internalize your perspective on my perspective, I get a capacity for self-transcendence or to use a more psychological term, metacognition um, on myself that makes me distinctly responsive in, in a way that other animals aren't. I take it that Proust is right that animals have procedural metacognition. They can sort of, they're aware of themselves insofar as they can correct their behavior, alter their attention. But we have this other capacity to rise above and reflect on ourselves and, and take a critical stance to our lower order perspectives, see ways in which we were egocentric or biased or irrational, or also positively ways in which we were particularly virtuous or, right? And, 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 and so we have this capacity, I internalize you in a way that makes me reflect on myself, but then makes me open to a call from you to justify my behavior precisely because I have this metacognitive capacity, right? So pre precisely because I do not, I'm not just intelligent like an animal and I have procedural metacognition, I can have what, you know, Greg Enriquez emphasis so beautifully in his work. I'm called into this other sphere where I have metacognition and then I have language broadly construed, I don't mean just spoken, I mean logos, and we can come back to that, that means you have access and you can place a demand on me precisely because you know 
that I have this metacognitive ability because you also have it. And we are then bound in this way that other organisms cannot bind each other. And for me, that, 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 that intertwining of internalization, self-transcendence, and then being called to, and notice the word, a, a responsibility, ability to respond mm -hmm. to you in a particular way. For me, those are the essential features of, uh, of personhood. And um, you well, mentioned, it, go ahead, go ahead. It, just, just to pick up on a point, it's yeah. interesting that one of the first things before we start speaking to one another as we're developing as little babies, one of the first things we yeah. start to do is point. Yeah. And so f first you have the, the interpersonal relatedness, um, but out of that, so, so, you know, I've held my little babies and they, they yeah, right yeah. from day one, you know, they're looking and they're gazing yeah. right up at you and, yeah, you're, yeah. And, 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 and you're having this, this interpersonal relatedness, but then very soon they start to point. Yes. And it's like, it's like that interpersonal relatedness transitioned transitions into shared perspective yes together yes, i yeah. want to call your attention exactly. um, so that you and i can share the same attention with this uh, third object and this uh, seems to me um you know the emerging of person uh that you're actually watching happening in real time Right. And then what, what and then it, so and by the way, uh, I think that's very important because I think relevance and salience are sort of the er normativity for cognitive emergence. Um, and so that ability to to the baby's ability, the, not the baby, we have the baby, I guess, infant uh, the mm -hmm. ability to draw you into their salience landscaping and also soon after allow you to draw them into yeah. your salience landscaping because you can point and they will start to look and and you know trying to get another animal we can sort of do it with dogs because we've doing we've been doing selective uh you know breeding on them for fifty thousand years and right they're sort of at the the stage of sort of like two-year-olds but they're they're really exceptions uh, to the rule yeah I, I agree that's right and then you have the next move where they learn language and notice the order First, they get what I would call dialogos, which is not necessarily spoken, but this binding, and they're starting to internalize your perspective on their perspective, and 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 right, and they're, and, they're, and like even at eighteen months, a, a child will pick up a picture and turn it towards you, or you can even with a younger child, you can you can put on the table a bunch of things, right, uh, uh, for them, and they only like the goldfish, they don't like the broccoli. But if they see you pick up a piece of broccoli, they'll pick up a piece of broccoli and give it to you, even though they don't like it. Like you can yeah. see the beginnings of all of this. And then you get language. And what's really interesting is language, you know, especially, you know, around three years of age, they get quite good at it, but they have no, no declarative metacognition. They obviously have very sophisticated procedural metacognition. We've already talking about it, but then they, that gets sort of, right? Language takes them out into the world. And for a while, you know this, they can't lie. They, like it's, they, they don't, they, they, language, they can't step back and have a metacognitive awareness of language as a thing in itself, right? Yeah, yeah. But they, around four years of age, they get that, oh, I can use this to make dad think that. They're, they're, they're horrible liars, but the, the first time your child lies, not by accident, but you can tell with intent, that's a very pivotal moment, uh, it's, yeah. right? And, and so then they get that. And then very, very quickly with that, I, I remember my son, my, my younger son was four, about four and a, and a couple of months and we driving in the car and he did something that he had never done before. He reported introspection. He said, dad, dad, it's snowing outside, but only in my head. He was imagining it and he could, yeah, right? And, and, right. And if you ask, a, a, like a three and a half year old, what's go, what's all going on in your your head or your mind? They'll say blood or something like that. They can't <laughs> right, they can't do that introspection. And then right after they get that, they start to get like they start to get uh, they start to get better with narrative. Like a, a four year old's narrative is pretty incoherent, right? But then they start to make the kind of fluidity with metacognitive perspective taking that you need in order to do narrative. And and around that same time, and these overlap. They start to do metaphor, which is, again, an ability within language to play different perspectives off against each other. And you can see, and for me, I think of that whole process as this process of this increasing internalization 
It's not just quantitative, but qualitative. Self-transcendence, and then the growing sense of a responsibility to others and to even to language itself. And for me, that is the whole arc of personhood. Yes, well, I, I wonder whether the, the kind of way you're framing personhood has uh, serious ramifications also for the field of aesthetics. Right. Um, I, I mean, when, when one, when you go to an art gallery, one of the first things that, that a lot of people notice is that there's this huge qualitative difference between walking around an art gallery on your own and walking around with a friend. Yes. Right? The, yes. The, the sharing of attention yes. uh, on, these, on these works and talking about them uh, has a, a completely qualitatively changes the experience. And then it's very interesting because when you are getting into um, uh, criticism of works of art, what you find is that you are treating the merit or demerit of the piece of art as if you, there's something objective here to talk yes. about. You're not merely um, uh, describing your tastes. No, no. You're, tre you're treating it like that, but you realize that the kind of arguments you're making are not the hard propositional or syllogistic uh, arguments. No. You're, you're inviting your friend to keep such and such in mind when, when he or she looks at this piece or, or to um, you know, uh, remember what the artist's life was like when this piece came yeah. in. And, and you're, 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 if you like, rather than making propositional arguments, you're making the kinds of arguments that are invitations. Yes. You're making these kind of teasing invitations. And, um, and, and I'm, that's not in any way to, to say that aesthetic judgment isn't itself objective, but it's something more like saying perhaps part of the objectivity of, its, of the brilliance of such and such a piece is found in the kind of perspectival thinking that the piece inspires so that you can enter into communion with the object. Yeah, I think that's very well said. There's two things that come to mind for that. The first is something parallel strongly, maybe even isomorphic in the work I do on uh, human reasoning, human rationality. So it's becoming increasingly apparent. There's a book, The Enigma of Reason by Mercier and Sperber that collects a lot of this together. I have criticisms about the modularity thesis, but that's that's a specific thing for Cogsci. The, 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 the thing that is really provocative in the good sense of the word is just this massive amount of converging evidence that we reason much better dialogically than monologically. That, right? And so, for example, you can take tests um, like the Ways and Selection task, and even Bright University students, very simple task, right? But and test very basic, you know, conditional reasoning, and only 10% of them get it right if it's abstract. If you, if you put content in it, and it's not clear whether they do better, but reliably, and these are the brightest cream of the crop people, very simple task. And it's it just is one among many examples, 10% success rate, reliably, robustly, no replication crisis with this result, right? You take that same task and you put people in a group of four and I'll let them talk with each other about it. And the success rate goes up to around 70%. Oh, okay. Reliably. And this is just an example of many, many instances where the dialogical um, act, actualization of the collective intelligence of distributed cognition is much, much better. It, 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 it's becoming, I think, a very plausible hypothesis that we evolved to do problem solving and reasoning dialogically with other people. The we space is actually really important. Now, that, that's the first point. And the second point is, that lines up with something else that you're mentioning with the work of art, but you also need it. Uh, there's something transpropositional, translogical about rationality, which is exactly this. It's also looking like many of the biases all are just different aspects of the my side bias, a, a, a specific kind of egocentrism in our reasoning. And you can be extremely logical within that, but right, you need something translogical that breaks you out of it. It's like, you, you know, Spinoza, maybe one of the most logical of philosophers said, you know, in the end, reason can't do it. You need love because only mm -hmm. love is the only thing 
that can right reorient right so that the super salience of of the egoic center can get displaced and the arrow of relevance can be turned and so uh and dialogue uh especially when it's what i call dialogos when it has that platonic element where people are both inviting each other and affording each other to self transcend i think that's plato's great insight about how deeply um, that is needed by rationality. And of course, DC Schindler is arguing this yeah, very much yeah, throughout absolutely. his work. And so you can see that the, the art, the aesthetic, I should say, yeah. and, 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 and what we, we sort of maybe prototypically think as the rational, actually are not far away from each other. They're much closer than the Enlightenment has told us, I would sure, argue. Sure, sure. I mean, one of as you were talking, I was thinking a, a little bit about Martin Buber's thesis. In of course, um, yeah. And and you know, uh, as you know, he he makes this case that actually you can have two perspectives on the world. You can have an I it perspective, or yes. you can have an I you perspective. Well, another way to to say that, if we were to transpose that into the kind of language we've been using so far is you can have a second personal relationship with the world or yes. here, here's another way to put this persons have the capacity to extend the notion of personhood analogously to impersonal objects yes right? and, yes. and 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 so you can enter into that relationship which is a relationship of meaning it's one that calls you to account it's one that's self-transformative or you can have um an i it relationship which is fundamentally third personal that's yes. a third person already. Now, what's if you were to put this into um, questions of dialogos? It's yeah. quite interesting that you know, in 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 this country, uh, as many people know, the most successful universities um, that, that comprise Oxford are the um, are, are the the universities where the tutorial model of teaching still prevails, right. rather than the lecture hall model yes, yes. where it where in the end the relationship you have with your teacher and with your fellow students is always third person yes. you you listen and then you reflect on what he or she said or the questions that were asked by him or her but what but but when you're in the tutorial model you're having this constant dialogue yes. going yes. on in the room yes and and the consequence of that is that the students do flourish i mean yes you know these universities have their own problems but the students do flourish and the you know the the, the jury is in on that the date the data indicates that uh quite clearly thank you for sharing that because i totally agree with that um i think that's right i think the evidence and and now and and so there's that which you could call you know well-established case study evidence we've got this experimental evidence we have good philosophical argument uh so there's like, they're all converging to, in a way that affords tremendous insight. So I think this is a highly plausible argument that's being made. Uh, two things about that. Uh, so, and I mentioned this to you last time we were talking, Buber's I-Thou I, I, relationship, um, uh, you know, and I talked a lot about this in the series I did with Zevi Stav and, and with Guy Senstock. Uh, but for me, God is that kind of no thing. Um, I have to speak apophatically. Uh, that is kind of the maximal or optimal of this capacity to it to be internalized into the depths of my psyche which you might call my soul the depths of my psyche and afford the 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 most self-transcendence you might call my spirit right and so right for me uh, that's how i understand buber's uh, argument that that it, it, you can only you can only properly and, and i'm doing this so people don't hear propositional knowing you can only know god in the I that relationship. And then, as you said, that is not an isolated thing, precisely because God is not an isolated thing, right? That transpose, it's like it transposes and transfers uh, potentially to the whole world. And I and you can see convergence things from um, you know, the Kyoto School and you know, Robert Carter, uh, uh, knowing knowing the bamboo, the, the the idea, as you said, that we can take this second person perspective and come into come into knowing things. Uh, that way. I've been trying to explore this, Daniel Zuruba, Johannes Niederhauser, um, and, and other people about, and, and Guy Senstock, Krishna Matsupietro, that 
we can, you can move from an I it relationship, you pick up an object and what is its watch, right? And into what I think, and this is aligned with, I think what work Jonathan Rusin is doing, a, a phenomenological Platonism. And this will get us into the Neoplatonism at some point. But I can look at this object and instead of doing that, I can realize it's multi, that it's actually multi-aspectual to me. There's no, I can never actually fully see the object. And, and if you remember, the word eidos originally meant look or aspect of a thing, mm -hmm. right? And all the visual metaphors. And then what you realize, and, and this is, you know, a point that Husserl makes, but I think Marlo Ponti gets it better. Husserl thinks that this is kind of a, a completable in some conceptual way, and you can get to an essence, a necessary and sufficient set of, a set of necessary and sufficient conditions. But Ponti thinks, and I agree with him, Marlo Ponti, that no, no, this is inexhaustible, right? And right. because beyond all the perceptual things, then I can bring in all the imaginal, not imaginary, all the, ima I could imagine, well, you know, what would this watch look like from space? And also, well, you know, well, what, what could this watch symbolize to another, like all the, all the ways in which this could be, and I'm using that, you know, like, right? And then you get this sense, right, of like, the, the, the depths of it. And this is like the, the, the relationship you have with a person, you're right. And, and then what's interesting for me is there's a through line. These aspects do, are in no way experienced as incoherent with respect to each other, right? There's this inexhaustible, and so I call it the through line. And the through line is not itself an aspect. It is that beyond all aspects, which binds them in this inexhaustible intelligibility. There's a musicality to it. And for me, that's much closer to what, how I understand uh, the IDOS. But the thing, do you notice what was happening? You're getting into a dialogical, yes, but it's yes. not, you're not talking to the object like in some sort of crypto animism. What you're doing is your perception is taking on the capacities that have been trained by personhood to unfold this in a way that can't be unfolded if you have an eye at relationship to it. I'm sorry that went for a bit, but I just wanted no, to- No, 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 uh, no. I mean, um, there's so much there. Um, one of my favorite passages in Buber's Iron Now, when he right. talks about the God of the atheists. Right, and, right. And, 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 and I mean, he says in his own in his own terms something very similar to what you just said that he has this passage in which he says who is the the real atheist is it the devout uh self-professed believer right. who um whose prayer to god is always framed uh in the in terms of what what i need and what you need to deliver for my use Right. Right, 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 and then, and then, I mean, he doesn't use this term, but the kind of divine vending machine notion yes, of yes. God, yeah, which yeah. has reduced God to an it, has reduced God to an object of use. Or he says, is it the atheist who, nonetheless, in the night, looks out from his window into the void and speaks? Yeah. Right. And yeah. and Buber kind of leaves this open, but essentially um, he's making the point that actually God can only be known in the I thou relationship. And this is this is why, um, you know, R Roger Scruton in his in his book, it's like, uh, I think it's the face of God. It might be the soul of the world. Anyway, uh, one of his the two last books he wrote, uh, he says um, that. The, the person who's really seeking God, the person who's, who really wants to know God, and one of the mistakes is he will go to, if you like, God's officials, he will go to the, the <laughs> clerics or the, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and they will they will start offering catechetical instruction, yes. or they will start to um, uh, give theological propositional knowledge, or they will start to give philosophical arguments for why it's reasonable to, to believe in God. And Roger says what the person is asking for is a, uh, is a biography of a mystic, right? Because what, what he really wants to know is what does a person look like who is in an I thou relationship with God? Because that's the kind of relationship I'm looking for in yes. my life. Yes. Right? Yes. 
And, and, and so Rogers concludes, you know, he says, really, the only God I'm interested in is the God of the mystics. And this is, this is kind of the conclusion to which I arrive in, in that, that book, which you kindly mentioned a moment ago in my, in my book on, on the Neoplatonism of Aquinas. But we don't need to go into uh, the technicalities of his, of his metaphysical structure or the ontology in which his metaphysics is worked out. But um, what that ontology gives rise to is the notion that when you behold the world, albeit with its manifold imperfections and its fallenness, when you behold the world, you're looking, like, you're looking at something like a portrait of God. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and that's that's great because that 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 means the world is the emanation of God. It's the self communication of God. I think actually, rather than a portrait, which gives rise to a kind of the metaphor itself is kind of deistic. It, 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 I like uh, Tolkien's idea of you know the the world as music, right? Yes. Which he, yeah. Which he John conveys. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. You're right. Exactly the same thing. Um, and. and uh, but but in any sense, you get this model of of the world as the self communication of God. But the problem is, that's fundamentally third personal, mm -hmm. right? It's still it's still this thing which yes. can say something about me, and this seems to be resolved. And I think for Aquinas, it, it was resolved in the mystery of the incarnation, mm -hmm. where 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 God can enter the world and say to those whom he wants to communicate himself to you know he he who sees me sees the father you know that's that's uh, then then suddenly um the, the whole need for i thou and the whole overcoming of the frustration of of natural religion i suppose it is it that is all resolved in the mystery of the incarnation at least that is how i've 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 read it mm -hmm. I think, uh, I mean, um, <laughs> this gets me into dangerous waters because I don't consider myself a Christian, but sure. uh, but I, 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 I always attempt to talk in deep good faith to fish, Christians who want to talk to me in good, uh, good faith. But I, I um, so I say this carefully, <laughs> I, I, I think Christian Platonism, Neoplatonism in some, in some important ways is superior uh, to non-Christian Neoplatonism. However, I then would, I'll, I'll counterbalance that with saying there's something really important about Neoplatonism because it seems to be able to go into other, many religions and do this. It can go into yeah. Islam and get, yeah. you get Sufism, it can get, interact with Judaism and, and get Kabbalah and other forms of Jewish mysticism and Zevi Slavin is exploring that beautifully. It, it, and you can even see that coming to fruition in Spinoza in a really profound way. And, and, and then there are people Thomas Plant is a Christian, for example, but he's saying, you know, you can take uh, Dionysus's uh, Neoplatonism and you can get into this deep mutual shaping with Pure Land Buddhism. Uh, and, and, and so there's something to me, and I hope you take this the right way, that is trans-religious about Neoplatonism that is very, very important. It seems to be, and, the, and, the, and one more thing, Neoplatonism also seems to be able to do this with respect to science. You've got yeah. multiple times the Renaissance and also at the beginning of the 20th century in which Neoplatonism and close and close things close to it enter into this reciprocal reconstruction, not with religion, but with science in this really fruitful and profound way. So I, I'm very... I, I, I don't just not disagree. I mean, I, I wholly in, endorse what you're saying. And actually, yeah. I think it's very important to recognize this. Neoplatonism as a, as a school distinct from Platonism as you know, emerged in opposition to Christianity. I, uh, and, and, you know, Proclus wrote a book called Against the Christians. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and I think I, I actually see something providential in this. And the reason I say that oh, wow. is that I, I, think it's, I think it's important that beyond the supernatural superstructure of what Christians understand to be the revealed religion, there is a natural structure which that comes to redeem and and bring to fruition and that and that structure is one that i think neoplatonism gives us and and because it's a natural structure it's a common language for ah. people, for, for all the different wisdom traditions to yes. be in dialogue with one another 
and it, and 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 it's and and I think it's Christianity that comes to illumine that. One of the things that I think Christians can be proud of regarding the the kind of history of our civilization is precisely that when Christianity spread out across you know Europe, for example, and it found Greek wisdom tradition and it found uh, Roman law and it found um, you know Northern European folk cultures. It it didn't it didn't seek to destroy them all or supplant them. It seek it 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 seek to um, raise them up into an embodied liturgical life right. because it believed that it had already found a common language which it could which, which it could elevate. Let's put it that way. And that I think is what what it's very important I think for Christians to recognize Neoplatonism as a common language. Uh, thank you for saying that because I've been trying to make the argument that um, Neoplatonism can, it can serve as, in, uh, as a philosophical silk road. It can serve as yes. a courtyard of dialogos as opposed to the courtroom of debate that we now yes. have, that has now become endemic in our culture. Um, and, and, and so uh, thank you for saying that. I, I mean, one specific way in which I, I want, I want to, I, I want to, I want to sort of re 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 redeem the promise of why I, I said uh, I, I, I find a superiority in Christian Platonism. That move that I mentioned earlier, that that move, that essential move that it, within personhood of self transcendence, because I can internalize and then I can turn the arrow of relevance away from egocentrism to not not. How, and think about your petitionary prayer. How is this relevant to me? I can turn that arrow to how am I relevant to this? How am I relevant to how? And that's what responsibility is ultimately, the, like true responsibility, not you're doing it begrudgingly, but what the Greeks might call sophism. You're, you're naturally disposed to doing this. Uh, that, that for me, uh, that is that, uh, as I said, that takes love. Now you can see Plato in the Neoplatonic tradition transforming and stretching and trying to reshape eros the, yes. no, the greek notion of eros and they can't it can't quite work and then the christians come in and i do think this goes back to jesus of nazareth and they pronounce the the the, the, the radical nature of agapic love right and you see something very very similar in buddhism with, around karuna the same metaphors of you the mother relationship to the child as the primary metaphor right where agapic love is exactly wait i'm i'm a person and I have been made by other people in this way we've been talking about dialogically, and 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 there and I'm I'm profoundly obligated, not on, but not only obligated. It's what uh, Frankfurt calls love as a voluntary necessity. There's a necessity, but I I want to do it. I want to I want to love agapically. I want to be invested in the creation of persons that have an existence and a value independent of my egocentrism, yes. and, and, right? And, and, and for me, Christianity said, so this is overly simplistic, Sebastian, so take it, take it as a, like, says to Neoplatonism, well, you, 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 you've done some really great work on logos. You've really helped, you know, uh, do really lay that out. And you've got something about that, but you need this, right? Because you really, you can't get the depths of logos in dialogos ultimately without Agape. Agape and Logos are interdefining. And, and, and for me, what that's one of the primary messages, right? The New Testament. John, you know, in the beginning was the Logos and God is Agape, right? The, the, these fundamental pronouncements. And so, right, that that is what I find really, really, and what I what I see happening, again, um, uh, I, I'm right, I, 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 I'm trying to say this as charitably as possible. But I see like when Neoplatonism goes into Islam and, and you get Sufism and then this kind of agopic love comes to the fore again, right? Like yeah. there's, 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 a deep, there's a deep cognitive cultural grammar that's being accessed and, and activated and actualized in a very profound way. Yes, and I think, I think you find something similar, as you said, among, in the monastic tradition in, yes, in yes, A yes. Asia, which I was, uh, you know, among the Buddhist uh, monks, I was, I was very fortunate to spend a lot of time in Buddhist monasteries when I was in Asia. I think you find something similar among the ascetic tradition in, uh, in Hinduism. Yes. Um, and, and, that, and that's why I think it is important to recognize this common wisdom language. That, yes. that, that Neoplatonism affords us. Now, uh, I'm going to I'm going to 
say something that is not very ecumenical so you'll have to uh sort of yeah yeah um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah but but one one of the things that i think uh one of one uh, how, uh, i want to put this delicately um one of the things that i think was very unfortunate about the protestant reformation mm -hmm. was precisely that you because of uh, luther and calvin's conception of uh natural creation as as completely destroyed by the the yeah. uh, uh, introduction of sin into the world it, you this gives rise to uh, a uh, anti metaphysical uh, um attitude very much so very much so and what's interesting is that this emerges um in a way that coincides with a contractual conception of how salvation takes place yes which is very interesting because um one thing i don't have with my wife or my children is a contract right yes. i have a relationship <laughs> i have a, a covenant right we never <laughs> si yeah, yeah. signed a, saying you know um th these are the terms you've got to honor or whatever we we are just living together and day by day just growing and trying to flourish and bring about each other's flourishing and we've got this kind of ongoing dialogue and and of course this is what this is a, if you like a perfect analog of the devotional life this is what monks in the western yeah. tradition on yeah. you know in benedictine abbeys and on mount athos and the, this is what they make their entire life about which is which is seeing this metaphys apprehending the metaphysical framework of the world, seeing that, that they have found themselves in a world that is not completely wrecked by sin, but is fallen and corrupted, but nonetheless pregnant with meaning and the context in which they work out their dialogue with the author of that meaning. And they do it through, just as I kiss my wife as I pass her in the hallway or whatever, so too they, take the holy water and bless themselves they attend the liturgy yeah. they and all of the all, all, the entire liturgical life is just if you like uh an elaborate way of repeatedly saying i love you to god right mm -hmm. it, 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 and, and so um one of the things that you know i i obviously want to work closely with with christians of of uh, you know any any formal color or whatever you know I, 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 but 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 i think from a historical perspective we have to recognize that that this um this bringing into the inner chamber of a liturgical life the primacy of logos and dialogos for a meaningful life was one of the monumental achievements of the christian tradition and that this was morphed in some way at the reformation but i don't know if you agree on with you well uh, there's a couple of things to say about that um uh, I, I i agree in ways that have got me into trouble <laughs> uh, uh, pleasant trouble i'm going to be having a dialogue with paul van der Klen. i forget the name of the gentleman who has who's criticized my take on luther um and paul paul van der Klen has uh, been critical of it. Um, I, you know, perhaps I should have attributed some things to Calvin rather than to Luther. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 for me, the fact that the monasteries are shut down in Germany is telling about something deep, a deep change that had happened. And this is the, the loss of, to me, this is the beginning of the loss no, sorry, that is exactly wrong. This is not the beginning of the loss. This is of, of the wisdom tradition. It starts earlier. The rise of nominalism, I think, really sure. starts. Sure. And, and whether or not Luther was a nominalist, um, I think it's fair, very fair to say he was deeply influenced by nominalism. That's why he reduces the number of the sacraments. It's hard mm. to explain it in, in any other way, right? And things like that. Um, but that loss of uh, that, that, is a, that is a particularly uh, important rupture right, uh, that accelerates the loss of the wisdom tradition in the West. And, you, and, and you, you, it, that's where you can see the connection between Christianity and Plato being severed um, in, in, in kind of a very uh, a, a deep way. Uh, 
And, and so this gets us quite nicely to the topic of embodied knowledge, I think. Yes, I, 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 I think I think I think you put it contractually and I, I don't disagree with that. Um, uh, I put it in terms of that what happens is you get propositional tyranny. You get that um, that the other kinds of knowing are not important. What's important is the possession, assertion, and, and, and fealty. I'm not, I'm not trying to make it, you know, a, a pious fealty towards sets of propositions. This is where credo, to use my language, credo stops being in service of religio and starts to dominate it. Uh, and, right, and, right. right. And, and for me, uh, that, that is, that, that, uh, the, I think that's how I would put what you were saying. And for me, that's, it, it's no coincidence that this is being bound up with, right, the idea of uh, the, the new way of reading. You're not reading transformationally. You're reading in, in to be informed, to gather propositions yeah. into logical coherence. I mean, and it, it, it's, it's very, it's, it's not very long thereafter when you get the idea that I don't need to undergo transformations to have fundamental truths disclosed to me. All I need is a universal calculus, right? And it's no coincidence that Leibniz is in Germany, right? I need a universal calculus uh, and you, know, and you see it in Descartes too. And, all, and then I can just calculate all truths. And, and, and notice how that removes me permanently, right? From the second person perspective. So here's something I would want to say, and then this gets us into in, in, the connection to for e-cognitive science, I think is very strong, which is this idea. The stuff we're talking about, the, relationship, the, the personal relationship to other persons, the agopic logos, right? And also how that gets a kind of optimality, but also an inexhaustibility right, that, that like I was trying to do with the eidetic adduction on my watch, right, right, God is, is, is that for me, uh, uh, well, that's how I understand many people in this tradition talking about the no thingness of God, it's not privation, it's that, it's this, yes, right, the, the, all of this comes together in this, in, in these, for me, I, ideas that I think are very Im importantly coming into prominence in 4E cognitive science, that there are huge aspects of cognition that disclose and are realized in both senses of the word in the, in the fact that there are real relations between us and the world and that's the core of cognition cognition isn't in the head cognition is fundamentally between me and the world and and, and this is discloses what i call the transjective dimension that dimension that is lost in the so-called exhaustive dichotomy between the subjective and the objective this is a point that i got very powerfully from tillich all right, obviously influenced by Heidegger. No, no, but there has to be something below the subjective and the objective, or else they could never be in relation. They would be incommensurably divided from each other. And that transjectivity is only accessible in this kind of existential, personal transformation that human beings go through. And you have people like L.A. Paul, transformative experience from the heart of the analytic tradition, writing about, well, you know, you can't infer your way through. You can't reason your way through a transformative experience it, because it involves perspectival and participatory knowing in, in profound ways. And yet the most important personal decisions, existential decisions I make in my life, like whether or not to marry this person, whether or not to have this child, whether or not to change my career are transformative experiences. And we put people into these experiences and they have no language no metaphysics for transjectivity and transformation and how they're bound together in this profound way. We've talked about this before. Um, this seems to have had a very dramatic effect on uh, how we understand what the purpose of the academy is. Yes, yes. So, so we, we think of knowledge primarily as technical principles yes that with which with which people must be equipped so that they can apply them in some role which of course is a third personal approach to somebody because it makes them a transferable replaceable uh, uh yes. entity in some kind of uh some kind of organization or or, yes. or productive machine 
they can be switched uh, with somebody who happens to have accumulated the same technical principles and can apply them in the same way. And, and so uh, the academy itself has gone through this process of becoming um, the very thing that reframes you as a commodity, which can then be uh, injected well into the market, yeah. rather than the academy being the place of self-transformation, where you, the question is not, what can I do with my education? The question is, what can my education do with me? How can yeah. I be transformed? Yes. And, and of course, things like the the things that we used to think were ends in themselves that things like the 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 learning of an instrument or the reading of poetry or or the criticism of a of a great of a great book we think of these things as um useful insofar as we can derive some knowledge from them but then we've completely misunderstood the point of returning time and time again to a poem the reason why you you pick up the poems of John Donne or whatever and you sit there and you read the same poem and you do it the next day and the next day is not because you're you're accumulating applicable principles, but because each time you read that poem, it's doing something to your heart, right? And 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 you don't that's not something that that uh I mean, I don't know, maybe you could make some argument that this is applicable insofar as you then return to the world of interpersonal relatedness, changed, uh, able to participate in that world better. Yeah, um, so, so there's two, that, that I, I agree at everything. And, and I mean, there, there's sort of three points I wanna make. Uh, one is um, we've lost the Socratic aspirational sense of the self. And we, and part of it is, you know, due to romanticism, there's lots of great stuff in romanticism. I'm a big fan of Blake, for example, uh, but at least how a decadent form of romanticism is not, uh, your identity is a possession rather than a relation. Yeah. And, and then you are, and what, and your only responsibility is to be true to it. Uh, and, and here I'm thinking of Adorno's critique of authenticity as this, you know, superlative value. It's like, well, it, 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 we could mean hot authenticity in the Heideggerian sense, which is very relational, or we can mean, no, no, the only relation I'm talking about is to the self I have, and, and I have to be, right? And, and, and so that, I think, uh, like, really undermines why it would be important for you to undergo transformation. Like, if you think of the self that way, you're not, call, you're like, why do I need to transform? All I need to do is, fit, I just need to find myself. The language is telling. The language is really telling. Um, so can I interject? It's, in, yes, it's, yes, just, it's, in, it's interesting that, you know, in, in uh, Hamlet, Polonius uh, s s says, to, you know, to thyself, you must be true. And he's the idiot of the play. Yes, <laughs> yeah, 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 yes, very much. <laughs> and, 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 and his incapacity to enter into like abiding relationships with things like Hamlet plays with the fact that he can just get Polonius to see things differently without realizing what that means. Yeah. But but that brings me to the other point, which is like the the Dunn poem. For me, uh, um, for me, this is yeah. I'm gonna, I'm going to be a little bit strong on this. For me, this is the defining feature of sacredness, is that di dialogical inexhaustibility. But it, it, but I don't mean that passively. What I mean is, I read Plato a certain stage of my life. It transforms me. I go out into the world, and things are disclosed to me that wouldn't otherwise be disclosed. They affect me. I go back and I now see things in Plato that I hadn't seen before. And for me, this is the anagogy that Plato talks about. Like when you're leaving the cave, right? You get into this dialogical loop with, world, with the world and you, you start to go deeper into the sinews of the psyche and you start to probe the deeper pa patterns of the world. And you get, you can literally, like when you put human beings into relationships of mutually accelerating disclosure, they fall in love. That's yes. what, that's, Right, and you can. And Plato's great insight is well, you can fall in love with the, what's you know the really real within you and without you, and how they're bound together. So for me, what you just talked about with the Dunn poetry, I think that that, that is like uh, this language. I, I want to say you're educating, but almost in the, the Platonic sense of a drawing out, adducing. Right, you're educating people in a capacity for the sacred. And, and, and the sacred is is what we've it, 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 it's a, a kind of touchstone experience 
right? For me, that, like when I get that sacredness with the Republic, for example, that doesn't stay, or like when I'm doing Tai Chi Chuan, and I get that kind of sacredness with the chi, the chi isn't an energy in you, it's this kind of musical re relationship between you and the environment. And when I, what happens is, and, and I don't even need to do it, I participate in it, That's, that percolates like out through my life and permeates through my psyche. And, I'm, I, and I start, for me, like if you were to ask me, what's the most important you th thing you do? It's, I would say, well, that is, because that, right? That makes everything else of value, valuable to me, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So uh, for me, uh, 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 like the fact that we have gotten so far from seeing how important that is to being a person, like it used to be, it wasn't that long ago, but you could say, why am I going to the university? Because I want to become a better person. And people yeah. meant it deeply and seriously. And now the, they don't say that, but what happens? And and and, and I'm not, I'm not trying to take credit. What happens in some of my courses with, when when I when I sort of share my participation in this with my students, they wake up to that. And then many 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 of them said say to me, "This is what I wanted university to be." Yes, yes. Uh, I think it's one of the. It might be the foremost problem, uh, uh, epistemic problem. Uh, of of late modernity that we confuse ends and means yeah and and and, and the university it seems to me is is the place of ends right yeah. that is the place where where you say ah oh, all this world that i've seen where people are doing things for the sake of and suddenly i've arrived at the place where the thing for which they labor is disclosed to Yes. And I and I can just um, I can just let myself be formed by it, and therefore enter the because of course education at that level was always education for the polis, yes. right? Yes, and, yes, and 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 people will still say that, but they don't know what it means. So the guy who goes and does his PPE or politics degree at university, he thinks that he can then enter the political arena because he's got a set of uh, political right. principles that he can then go and apply as a politician. But what university was supposed to do is not give you a set of principles, but give you the heart of a statesman. And yes. once you've got the heart of a statesman, then you can go and you don't even have to remember the principles because you are that thing because yes. of what you have been immersed in for the last three years. That's what a university was supposed to do. It was supposed to educate you for the polis, which means a, a a program, I mean, it's a terrible word, but uh, let's, let's, uh, a program of self transformation. Yes. And you made, you made this excellent point when we were last chatting, which was that um, one of the great tragedies is that the university has become separated from the sacred arena that it inhabited at its yes. conception, yes. where, where you went to these tutorials, you had this dialogue and that dialogue went out into the cloister where you would walk with the students and continue and, and suddenly yeah. it was becoming part of it was it was becoming less formalized and it became part of your informal discussion as you immersed yourself in this beautiful context and then you would enter the liturgy and you would hear the chanting of the psalms yeah. and yeah. you would uh, adopt different postures you would kneel you would stand you'd put your hands together yeah. and so and 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 all of this is a context of self-transformation rather than here's some stuff that your job is to understand then assent to then regurgitate at exam level and then we'll know that you're something that can be sold to the market I, which is a complete it's a it's a it's a, i mean sorry i'm getting a bit passionate but no, please um, I, I, I love your passion of it. no no, no, <laughs> you know, no we're yeah. doing the wrong thing for these young people yes that's the issue at stake yes i agree i i I, I mean, two things about that. I think part of it uh, is the historical separation of the university from the church and the monastery, because uh, you can think of the monastery, they interpenetrate. So this is only, a, 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 I'm only making a statement of emphasis, not of essence, mm -hmm. but the monastery emphasizes wisdom. The university emphasizes knowledge, but knowledge for wisdom and wisdom for knowledge, right? And then the church emphasizes, no, no, 
those things you're doing in the monastery and in the you know, in the ivory tower, they have to be translatable, deeply translatable in both senses of the word into the lives of people. Because if it becomes, and so, right, and it, that, that functionality was really, really important. You know, let's do knowledge, let's do wisdom, and then let's have this uh, the, an institution that keeps demanding that the, the knowledge and the wisdom are not only for each other, but for the culture, for the world. Yes, yes, and I, and I think that, um, I mean, what is the word that denotes the relationship that exists between knowledge and wisdom? I, I would submit that that word is understanding yeah very much and that that is it's interesting i picked up my uh, dictionary of philosophy the other day there's no entry for that word right philosophers have nothing to say about well, uh, understanding they do now but you know where you yeah. have to look for them in the philosophy of science yeah i do because i've done a lot of work on the philosophy of understanding and there's a lot of great work being done there and and also the the philosophers who are like keeks who want to talk about wisdom They'll talk about understanding. Interesting, just a little bit of etymology. Yeah. The German is actually was understanding to be among other people. Right, yeah. Right, it was inherently an inherently dialogical notion. And the fact that we've shifted also means we've shifted uh, the, 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 uh, the way we understand, like we know it's that which is underneath, right? The substance, right? Um, uh, and we've lost, we lost, no, no, but the original meaning was, right, was, was, was dialogical um very very properly and you see this in plato that understanding is only only gathered when dialogue is able to find you know the just like i can have multi aspects on the thing we have multi perspectives right on being and the dialogue brings and tries to find the through line uh in them yes, yes. But, but but the the thing that the, the thing you said there uh, it reminded me about there's a deep connection between culture, cultivation, cult, sacredness, right? Um, and this is a point that Zach Stein makes, and I think it, it's it's brilliant. Um, and I, you know, in his book, A Time Between Two Worlds, education used to be a commitment to in, intergenerational fidelity and affordance. Yes. That what 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 was happening in education is one generation was passing the torch of the culture to another generation because and this is this is well studied uh, culture give us what's called the ratcheting effect you and i don't have to learn from scratch we have this 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 savings right that it, this repertoire that is bequeathed to us it, 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 right and, and, in, and, and here's the right word it's entrusted to us and then we are entrusted to ratchet it up and pass it on and he points out that this interge intergenerational, which I think Zach would agree is, is inherently sacred um, understanding of education has been lost because of the short term, let's train people for the market uh, and prepare them for the market. We obviously have to help people uh, be able to find a living. I'm not saying that, that that's not sure. a responsibility. Uh, if anybody attributes that to me, I'm just going to say you're lying. You're misrepresenting. Yes, yes, yes. Agreed. Right. Um, um, but, but it, it, it does it, this in, it, this just this intergenerational uh, the, the 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 anthropological assumption behind that model of um, uh, of education this short term model of education is that the human uh, the human being needs to be thought of as something as like an abstraction yes right? so, so not the human being should not be thought of in the context of the context the, the the river into which he suddenly emerged right yes. that, that continues on now and our architecture speaks of this right i mean when when we build something we build something in a year and we build a big glass box and then we shove yeah. everyone in to do their jobs the, the people who started building goth gothic cathedrals knew they would never see their completion yes right? yeah. but they thought that they were immersed in a context of ongoing moral and material betterment and they were just part of the story and they were they were they yes. were already morally bound to all of those who had come before and all of those who were yet to be they were already morally bound now what is it to be in a context to be an existential human being who is morally bound to others that is to be a person 
Right? Yes. So yes. in in isolating yes. the person, thinking yes. of him as a, as as just a an abstraction, we're actually eclipsing the notion of personhood altogether. That's the really scary thing. Yes, I think it's both an abstraction and an atomization. Yes, there's, exactly. there's a sense of tearing apart and isolating. Um, and again, I think you know Rousseau bears some responsibility for making this right. Uh, you know, a premier value. You know. Yes. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, you and I both, you know, work in academic settings. You're going to Princeton, and um, it's funny when you mention this because my my undergraduate career went exactly the opposite way of the individual you're talking about. I started out in poli sci, and I moved deeper and deeper out. I moved out of it and into philosophy, uh, and right. went the other way because um, I I was coming out. Uh, I was I had been particularly set up by sort of the way I was brought up and the way I had rejected the fundamentalist Christianity I'd been brought up within, I would have been set up with a particular kind of hunger that meant I was looking for something different. Uh, but that that's very idiosyncratic. But what I came to see, and I think what's happened since Awakening from the Meaning Crisis and, uh, and a lot of convergent evidence is the meaning crisis has put many people into that same kind of situation where they are sensing simultaneously a profound need for meaning and wisdom, but a profound lack. And so it's almost inarticulate and inexpressible to them. They have this hunger and longing. And the number of people that my work and other people, I'm not, this isn't about me, but like when people, when I see people like yourself in this book, I think this book, and I hope you take this as a compliment, is a response to the meaning crisis. It's a way well, yes. of, yeah, yes, right. It, it was consciously that. Yes, great. Yeah. That, I suspected so. Yeah. When I, so when I, everybody that is doing, and then, that, and then what I see is when, when my students and even people that are in my social circle are touched by this in an articulate, in both senses of the meaning, manner, the response is often powerful, powerful, almost visceral. So, right, they they are disposed towards wanting a way of articulating and betrothing themselves to. No, no, there are things that are should be of value that are not they they, they are not things that can be brought into the marketplace. Again, I'm not being a crypto Marxist here or anything. Sure, like sure. That. Right, right, but but the very proper recognition. Of that, pardon me. It would be very difficult to accuse me of uh, being a Marxist. So, yes, yes. <laughs> right, but nevertheless, we are both saying the the market, like all, it's a powerful form of distributed cognition. It's a dynamical yeah. system. It can do very great things, uh, but we have fallen into a kind of idolatry uh, by making it the sole dictator of our grammar and vocabulary for trying to articulate the meaning of our existence. And I think that... Well, the, the, that, 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 that book, I mean, one of the reasons why I bang on so much about the, the instrumentalizing of education is precisely yes. because that's the kind of education that I largely received until I dropped out of school at 16 and went and joined an arts college. And yeah. I was able to prance about on the stage for the next uh, two years. But <laughs> what that meant was that I was I was reading great texts. I was reading Shakespeare, and I, you know, and I, I suddenly realised, ah, oh, there's there is there's material here which just enriches my life, it enriches my relationships, it enriches the way that I I can live now. Uh, and 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 then I realised that actually there was this whole other kind of education out there which used to be called humane education or liberal education in the pedagogical sense of the term, uh, which was, um, you know, philosophy, theology, languages, poetry, uh, yeah. you know, gr great books. And that this education wasn't to make you useful, but to make you flourish. Yes. Right? That's, that was the point of this, uh, this education. And it wasn't itself useful. The education wasn't useful. It no. was, it was meaningful. It, it was, uh, and so, exactly. yeah, so I sort of, I realized this. And, and then what happened was because I immersed myself in that education tradition, and I had to kind of dismantle the education I'd received and rebuild it up from the foundations 
yeah. as you know, uh, with a kind of renaissance conception of what education was. I then went out into the world and I walked in the Chiltern Hills and I walked through the woods and I realized actually it's not just these books that are meaningful, it's that the world in which I found myself is pregnant with meaning and I have been told my whole life that it's a resource, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a resource and actually it's not a resource, right? It's, it, is, it is something that, it is a world that we can use in order to make a home. Uh, in this world, but it's primarily um, pr pregnant with meaning and a source of meaning for me and for us. And so, and so I, I went on this kind of philosophical mission to say, well, can this be rendered in technical terms? Can you make a ro robust metaphysical and epistemological argument for the world being a, a realm of meaning and that it's right and just to see it in that way? And and that and and that's that book. That's how it emerged. Well, uh, uh, so uh, two things about that. I've been talking with Jonas. Uh, what's his name? Sovic. Uh, he. Uh, I'll release the video. Uh, I think this week. Um, um, I, 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 Jonas, I probably mispronounced your last name. But please forgive me. Uh, he's in, he's he contacted me because he's in Denmark. And he said, you know, the thing you're talking about, I, I have, I have this jokey phrase, the one stop enlightenment shop, right? And he says, you know, when you're talking about that, right? Um, well, he said, I've been it because here we have, and it's state supported, we have what's called folk high school. And the education is exactly what you just described. They've completed high school. And what you do is you spend two years and you're doing education and it's all about deepening personhood, and deepening your discernment of the, you know, the meaningfulness of the world. And, 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 and he said, yeah, you don't come out of it with any special certi certificate. You don't come out of it with any special designation. It's in that sense, it's completely useless. But he yeah. said, the Danish government, right, knows that this is, right, they're committed to, well, this makes good people, and, and, wow. right? And, and, then, and then you've got, uh, you know, the, the, the similarity for the other Scandinavian countries, the Bildung movement in which they created basically these secular monasteries where people would go as young adults, but you can go as an older adult if you wish, you're not precluded. And you can basically spend two years doing exactly what you just described. So yeah, yeah. far, because I, I can hear people watching this going, oh, that's so, oh, that's so airy fairy. No, 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 right? We, ha we, ha we, we, we have gun countries which, which are often countries that place in the top 10 for places to live in the world who have committed to this and they are reaping the benefits of it because they turn out to be some of the top 10 places in the world to live. Well, uh, and, and, and for those who are uh, dismissing uh, what we've said, um, what, what people have failed to realize in the modern age is that if you, if you, um, build something for useless reasons it it uh, the 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 side effect of that is that it becomes the most useful thing yes so so pe people who educate themselves for flourishing don't uh, it, 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 the side effect of that is that they become the most employable people Yes. Right. And and that's that's those are the kinds of people people want at management level. Those are the kinds of people uh, people want uh, as front of house engaging with yeah. others. Those are the people that we want to employ. And, and that's across the board. If you people who build buildings for um, for instrumental purposes um, very quickly have to knock them down um, because the technology changes and the working habits change and all sorts of things. But people who build buildings so that they're beautiful right those buildings just keep on being reused people want to use them as opera halls and they want to yeah. use them as restaurants yes. and they want to use yeah. them as museums and they want to use them as railway stations and they and they just keep on finding new uses for them why because they weren't built with use in mind right yes. this is across the board and we really got to learn this lesson because we're terrible at learning this lesson yes i agree so build for flourishing and you will always find a use that's See the point Seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? There you go. <laughs> so, Sebastian, we are not done by any means, but why don't we call it to a close for 
today. Uh, okay. And we can come back and pick this up and keep going. Um, I, I want to thank you. Uh, this was rich and juicy and flowing <laughs> and wonderful. And it, it's great getting to know you and to, to, to see you articulate uh, your, this vision. I'd like to give the people who are on my show uh, the last word. The opportunity to say what you how anything you want to say sort of well, summative. No, look, uh, I'm I, um I'm very grateful for this friendship. I think it's hugely providential that you and I met each other in Cambridge, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and that we've kept up this this conversation. And I um yeah I look forward to talking to you again. And and I look forward at some point to being with you in person. Yes, I would very much like that again too. <laughs> Thank you very much.